All right, great. Um, so first of all, thank you all so much for, for coming out tonight to Sustainable Claremont's Dialogue Series. Um, this evening, we have a really special one, and I think one that we're all very excited about. Um, and a lot of great friends and supporters from the Claremont community. So I, I think this should be a, a really great one. Um, before we get started, just a, a couple of announcements and um, just orders of business. Um, first of all, uh, if you're, you're here tonight, we're, we're glad that you heard about this dialogue. And, and one of the best ways to keep up to date on all the things that are happening here at Sustainable Claremont is to join our newsletter. Um, so if you're not already um, on our newsletter li list, um, Nicole's going to drop that into the chat box and please be sure to sign up. Um, after these dialogues, we do send a recording of the, the talk around to our newsletter list and then anything that comes up, um, we, all of that information is distributed through email. Uh, so a, a great way to stay connected. Um, some other quick announcements, uh, upcoming events at Sustainable Claremont. So in October, we're going to have our annual gala, um, which we're all very excited about. And also, as we transition to fall, we're looking at starting up our tree planting events. Um, so there are going to be a lot of opportunities for um, members of the community to come out and plant trees from Claremont, Rancho Cucamonga, all the way to San Bernardino and Pomona. So we're going to be planting in a lot of places. Really excited to be able to doing that, um, do that in person again. Um, and again, when we do put out those calls for volunteers, it'll be in our newsletter list. So make sure that you sign up. Um, before I introduce our speakers tonight, uh, just a little note to please hold your questions to the end. If, if you want to ask your question, um, hold it to the end and you could raise your hand and you'll be unmuted so that you can ask. Or you could just put your question into the chat box um, and Nicole and I will collect those questions and we can ask those to the speakers at the end. Um, Nina and Tina will also be looking at the chat and if they see your question, if it seems to kind of fit into uh, where they are in their presentation, they'll try to address those questions as they come in. Um, so introduction to our, our speakers tonight. So first we have um, Dr. Konofsky, who is a biology professor at Pomona College um, and has also been a visiting assistant professor of biology in the Claremont College's Joint Sciences Department. Um, she and her students have presented extensive ornithology and ecology related research to the Pacific Seabird Group. Uh, Konofsky's eco ecology research has also taken her to the Polar Polish Station at Hornsun, Spitsbergen, Norway. That's a tongue twister to study the dove keys eating habits and the correlating growth rates of chicks with colonies. Um, tonight, she's joined by the president of the Pomona Valley Audubon Society, uh, Tina Stoner. Um, part of the role at the Audubon Society is to do education and outreach to, to groups just like ours. So we're, we're super excited to have both of them with us tonight. Um, and uh, uh, Nina, I'll go ahead and throw it to you. Oh, thanks so much. I really appreciate the invitation to be here. And I really appreciate uh, Tina coming and joining me um, to help with this presentation because she has a lot of expertise and I'm excited you're going to get to hear it. Um, so let me share my screen. And okay, so hopefully you can all hear that, see that. Um, if there's things in the way of the screen, you can um, move around the controls on Zoom um, so that it's not in your way, or the pictures too, you can move those just to let you know. So um, my research is mostly on how the environment is changing and how birds are reflecting those changes, and in particular, um, I've been focused on climate change, um, but also other impacts um, as well. So um, I won't be able to touch on all the topics because like, that's like my entire uh, course that I teach, but I just wanted to give you um, some of the main um, things that are affecting birds in North America. And Tina is going to follow up with some of the things that we can do here in Claremont to help the birds. Um, 
a lot of people have been asking me lots of questions, especially during this whole past year when we've all been at home more. And a lot of people are noticing birds more and are really curious about um, the birds that they've, um, and maybe you've been seeing for the first time. So um, be sure to get your questions answered. Um, we will be sticking around to, to help answer any questions. Um, okay, so this um, talk is motivated by a paper that came out in 2019 about the status of birds in North America. And they collected data on 529 species of birds and they um, compiled all the data sets that were available on these birds that measured their numbers, their reproductive success, like how many chicks they were raising per year. And some of these data sets were like 50 years long. So um, really powerful data. And they coupled those data with another type of data, which is um, radar data. So you can actually see birds migrating through the sky with radar that we've really been using for weather monitoring. And what they found was that there's been a 14% drop in bird biomass since 2007. So that's pretty dramatic. And overall, they estimated a 2.9 billion bird loss since 1970. So this is a very dramatic change. And this loss has occurred in all different types of birds. So, um, you know, here we have from the Eastern, the tundra, Western boreal, which is up North shorebirds and the most impacted are grassland birds. Um, grassland birds have been suffering from um, agriculture, grazing, and pesticides that affect their, um, their food. The birds that were most vulnerable were ones that are migratory. So Claremont is situated along the Pacific Flyway and birds from the north go through California and migrate down south um, in the winter. And then they turn around and go back up north to breed in the spring and summer. Some stop here and breed in Claremont and some go on to Alaska and areas of the Arctic. These birds engage in these energetically expensive flights where they have to gather a lot of food. Then when they're stopping over in different places on their flights, they um, have to gather a lot of food quickly. And those stopover points are disappearing and they're facing a lot of hazards along their journey. So migratory birds are particularly vulnerable. And then and on top of that, we have climate change. With warming, a lot of the insects that emerge and they've evolved to arrive right when their food is available, everything's happening a little earlier. And so birds are arriving at the same time of year, but they're missing the peak of a lot of their food development. So that's another big impact on migratory birds. So the message was from this paper that one in four birds that were there in 1970 are gone. And that's just in terms of the numbers. That is a very dramatic change. So I'm going to give you the top two reasons for this decline in bird populations. The number two reason is bird window collisions. So this photo was taken um, from the art building on Pomona campus and a bird has hit the window and all the feather dander in its body slapped up against the window and left this mark. Um, an estimated almost 6 million birds die from hitting windows every year in North America. And what's interesting is that is that this paper 
found that the buildings that were accounting for a lot of this loss were residences, which is like almost half of the amount, and these low-rise buildings. So this is um, was pretty surprising, but there are f just fewer high-rises where we think about birds hitting windows because they're these big shiny buildings. So, you know, here in Claremont, we have a lot of these low rises and residential buildings. And so it's something we need to think about. Why do birds hit windows? Well, they can't tell what a window is. When they're in a tree, um, this is outside of a building, uh, the administration building on Pomona campus, they see this picture reflected in the window. So they think that there are more trees and sky to fly towards, and they don't realize that it's an impermeable surface. So this was a particularly problematic window, and some of my students and I, we draped string across the front of it to try to signal to the birds, there's something that is solid here. Don't try to come here. When a bird hits a window, some of them die instantly. The impact just shatters them. But some of them become stunned. And a lot of people have this, had this experience where birds hit a window and you've gone out to sea and it's lying there dazed and after a few minutes, it shakes itself um, you know, back sort of into alertness and flies away. But unfortunately, a lot of those birds fly away only to die just beyond where you see them because they have brain damage, they have eye damage. Um, and while they're in that stunned state, they're very vulnerable to being predated. So there's a definitely an underestimate as to the numbers of birds that are hitting windows because we can count the ones that we see dead, but a lot of them have flown away a little bit and we won't find those. Complicating things is the effect of light. So here we are in one of these bright spots and birds migrate with light. They are um, attracted to light. They become disoriented in artificial light. And so the buildings that have their lights on at night are particularly problematic. Here is one building in Galveston, Texas, that uh, was a 23-story building. And in one night, 346 birds hit that window, um, the windows of that building. So just because they had their lights on that night during the migration. So my students in my class, avian ecology, decided they wanted to uh, estimate how um, many birds were hitting windows on the Pomona College campus. And so they designed a class project where they went, got up early, an hour after sunrise, and went and counted all the dead birds they found around certain buildings. And they also measured windows by taking pictures next to a meter stick. And what they found was that there are certain buildings that were particularly problematic. But what was really interesting was that these were not necessarily the buildings with the biggest windows, but they were the windows that were facing north and that had trees and sky reflected in their windows. So you can imagine that a bird that's flying south sees a north facing window and that is why you get many more um, north collisions, north window collisions. And then the opposite would be for when they're returning from the south. Okay, now I'm gonna pivot to another impact on birds. And that is there's a global problem with invasive species. If you look at this map, the places where invasive species are impacting birds, mammals, and reptiles are islands. Look at this, Hawaii, the Galapagos, 
um, Madagascar, Australia even, is an island. And these are places where introduced rats, mice, weasels, cats, dogs, uh, pigs are having a huge impact. And here in California, so Claremont's located over here, um, we have our own islands, the Channel Islands, and we have our own history of invasive species. And we have one of the worldwide success stories. So I wanted to tell you this story because um, you may not have heard it. It's something we can be really proud of here in Southern California. But here is the, the islands outlined in green are part of the national park. But this island here, San Nicolas Island, um, you might have heard of because of the book, Island of the Blue Dolphins. How many of you have read that book when in, in school about um, the girl who was left behind on San Nicolas Island? Um, so San Nicolas Island um, ha is um, run by the Navy. They have a Navy um, group out there. And the Navy, in some time in the 1950s, the Navy personnel brought out some cats. And these cats were preying on some of the native fauna that were out there. Um, these are seabirds that the cats were eating. But there was also an island night lizard and an endemic San Nicolas Island fox, only found on that island that the cats were competing with for habitat. They inhabit the sim a similar niche. So in cooperation with a whole bunch of organizations here, and we actually have um, one of the leaders of this project here with us, so she'll be able to answer lots of questions. Um, Jen is here, so that's great. Um, cooperated to try to get rid of the feral cats on San Nicolas Island. This was a huge endeavor. Um, they had 241 traps set, and um, incredibly difficult terrain, which had the traps had to be um, checked daily. And they designed traps that wouldn't hurt the cats and also wouldn't hurt the island foxes that were also getting caught in the trap. They um, built a vet clinic out on the island and for every cat, they did some health measures. And while the cats were caught and in captivity for around two weeks before they were lift, airlifted off the island, several kittens were born. Um, and several biologists I know um, became um, cat owners in this, uh, during this project. <laughs> so the cats were collected um, and um, they were airlifted with the help of the Humane Society of the United States to Ramona, where they lived out their best days, and are, some are still there, um, in a facility where they're um, kept contained, but they have lots of enrichment and are living their best lives. So after that, they um, decided to, um, they had to monitor the island to make sure they had gotten all the cats and they set up these motion sensing cameras and they found all native fauna and no cats um, after 2010, including the island fox. And a big rebound of some of the endemic birds like this um, ashy storm petrel. So a great success story. So the number one, impact on birds of North America, on mainland North America, are cats. So even, um, so in this study, um, they estimated that 2.4 billion birds are killed annually by cats. Even cats that are fat and happy, um, when they're outside, they are really excited about birds. Um, and some owners have come up to me and said, yes, but my cat goes outside, but she never brings home any prey. And um, this is a big question. What is the proportion of prey that's brought back 
compared to what they're actually killing while they're outside. And so a study was done recently in 2020 in Cape Town, South Africa, where they equipped 20 cats with these um, cameras and they were able to track what is the proportion of prey that's brought back to their owners um, versus what they were killing outside the house and leaving there. And they found that only 18% um, were being um, returned home. So that is, um, if we're just estimating number of things killed by cats by what's returned home, it's a gross underestimate. Oops. This is a photo of all the birds that were returned back to owners in San Rafael, California, alive. And so these owners brought the birds into a wildlife rehabilitation center, hoping that they could be saved. And out of the um, 321 birds, 89 survived, but the rest didn't. So even though they're bringing back some prey that aren't killed, very few of them are able to survive um, a cat attack. And then there's the problem of feral cats or cats that are part of programs that are trapped, neutered, or spayed and released. Um, these cats actually are accounting for the most of all of the, the bird killings. And I just wanted to tell you one story that comes from Australia about the impact of a single cat. So these fairy terns here are um, incredibly rare and a community group was really excited because the colony had um, decided to make their home in their town of Madura, Cal um, Australia. And they set up a fence and signage and motion sensing cameras. And they found that some feral cats were visiting the colony. And so they trapped this cat here, the one in A, um, but they could not catch another visitor that um, was frequenting the colony, this white cat. And um, this cat was responsible for the complete devastation of the whole colony, 111 nests, and the decapitation of six breeding birds, which is actually a big significant chunk of the breeding population. So it was pretty, um, um, pretty horrific. And they eventually did trap this cat and they found that it was one of the cats that had been um, neutered but it wasn't um, living inside anyone's home. It was uh, a feral cat. And then to add to the um, problems of cats, other animals are also impacted. So this is the California sea otter um, making its way back from the brink of extinction, but they become infected with the same parasite that cats get but aren't affected by, which is Toxoplasma gondii. And what they found was in this study that the same, um, uh, the same parasites that were in the cats locally were the ones infecting the sea otters locally. So they did that but through um, genetic testing. So what happens is cats poop, they shed, they are the host for this parasite, and then the, this parasite um, gets washed into the water, and then um, and then uh, the the sea otters pick it up, and unfortunately, it's lethal for the sea otters. So my students wanted to find out in a class project what's happening in Claremont with cats, and so you may have received one of these cards asking you to fill out if you have a cat, if you let it outside, and what it's bringing back if it ever does, and some other questions. And they distributed these cards to different neighborhoods. And they also did walking surveys of, for cats, which actually were a total disaster because it ended up just being playtime <laughs> for uh, the cats and the students. Um, and so they, you know, in all the walks they did, which were five, um, 
they only found one cat per mile. So they found five cats and um, they didn't observe any hunting behavior. However, the cards that were returned from the survey um, revealed a very different story. So they scaled up from the um, data they collected and they estimated that Claremont has you know, around 4,000 outdoor pet cats and four birds killed per year. And that amounts to quite a bit. And I, I think this is probably an underestimate actually, even because this is a really small sample size, but um, um, I have reason to think that this is an underestimate also because they didn't include the feral cats that were, um, that are in Claremont. Um, and these unknown cats, as they're called, um, account for 69% of all the birds killed. So I know that's a lot of gloom and doom. Um, so, <laughs> um, but I now have some good news about concrete things that Claremont can do to sustain birds in our community and keep our cats safe and healthy. So with that, I'm gonna have Tina um, start her section. Do you have to pin me as the speaker, Nina? Yeah. All right, okay. All I see is you, so I can't tell if anybody else is seeing me or not. Okay, we're good, we're good to go. Well, first of all, I thought it was very gracious of Nina to tell you all the bad news and offer me an opportunity to tell you what the good news is. One thing I wanna emphasize is that cats are not native to North America. This is an introduced species. So kind of keep that in mind when we look at all these statistics about the damage that they do. But right now we're gonna talk about cat and window strike solutions. And these are easy, simple things that you can do around your home to help save birds, wildlife, and even lengthen the life of your pet cats. Next. Oop, other way, other way. <laughs> There we go. So when I say to you, what's the best way to keep a cat from catching a bird? Oops, let's go forward again one more, Nina. There we go. Uh, chances are you have heard of putting a bell on that cat. So here we have a nice little tabby with a purple bell, but is a bell on a collar enough? Next. And sadly, of course, the answer is no. Next. But look where this tabby is sitting. This cat is inside what's known as a catio. And what's a catio? An outside patio for cats. And so this cat is protected from predators that might want to go after the cat, such as coyotes. And the birds are protected by the screen around this catio from the cat. So if you think about the food chain, the cat is actually kind of in the middle. So by protecting your cat in a catio, you're allowing the birds to not become prey and you're allowing your cat to not become prey. And there's lots of different kinds of catios. Let's take a look at some. Next. Oh, well, first, what happens when you build a catio? Well, it unites both cat lovers and bird lovers. Look at the date on the publication on this paper. It was done just in June. Catios are becoming a big subject, very, very popular. Next. All right, so let's talk about those different types of catios. They can be as simple as a window box style, sometimes called a sunning platform for the cats. They can be a little bit larger, but definitely a space just large enough for cats, not large enough for people and cats. Then you can enclose a whole portion of your patio. Uh, this kind of reminds me a little bit of a small Florida room. Those of you that might've visited Florida have seen where outdoor spaces are screened in to prevent insects and snakes and other animals from coming into their essentially screened in backyard. And then they can also be quite large. They can be built specifically for the cats. Some people are converting old bird aviaries. They're converting gazebos and pagodas into oases for their cats that are separate from the house. Next. 
but you can also provide the cat outdoor exercise without even having a catio. And you can do this through catwalks and tunnels. In fact, I was first introduced to the idea of allowing a cat outdoors, but keeping it separate from the birds uh, by a cousin who had cats in a coyote heavy neighborhood. And she used a wire cage, very similar to the ones up here on the uh, upper right photograph, but it was down on the ground and it was against the block wall, which a lot of us have here in Southern California as our walls in our backyard. Now hers was not framed in wood and it was held in place with stakes, but it worked really, really well to allow the cats outside. It provided them with lots of outdoor exercise. Now, sometimes you can attach a separate catio to the home via one of these catwalks, and it can even be elevated so that you can walk underneath it. Next slide. Now, the, ironically, just the day before yesterday, my sister-in-law up in Auburn, California, texted these photos of the catio she was building on her deck. She had no idea I was giving this lecture tonight. And so I was just delighted and said, can I use your photos? And she said, well, yeah, of course. So my sister-in-law, Becky, she built this one out entirely by herself out of PVC pipe. And the PVC provides the basic framework where she could stretch and attach this plastic netting, which is put on with simple zip ties. The end result, one very happy outdoor cat. Next slide. Now you can get as extravagant with your materials and designs and colors as you want. You can keep it simple like my sister-in-law Becky's, which is designed primarily for un, I'm sorry, for supervised outdoor use. Some of these are sturdy enough that you could let the cat have access to them by day or by night. I love all the colors in this one on the left. I think it's quite creative, but I also wanted to point out that even though it's relatively small, there are count them one, two, three, four, oops, there are actually five levels to this catio, giving the cat a variety of heights and places that it can hide. This one on the right, obviously done by an NFL fan, um, allows extra space so that you could actually sit in there with your cat. Next slide. And you might've thought that those were pretty exciting. Well, guess what? There are people that travel with their cats and RVers have figured out a way to create catios for the recreational vehicles. The first time I saw one was actually in Palm Desert on the roof of a motorhome where I was visiting some friends. This one on the left is so ingenious and so inexpensive. These are those simple wire mesh cubes that are collapsible, modular, you just snap them together. Something you might send your college student off to school with to create extra space in their dorm room. And these people hung it outside their window. Oh, there's your birdie. <laughs> Little entertainment. <laughs> And so it's, it's a nice, easy way for the cats to have access to the outdoors. This other one I thought was kind of intriguing because it looks to like a PVC frame with a nylon base and netting over the top or mesh that would not allow insects into the motorhome. And it's suspended between the pop-outs on two sides of a fifth wheel. All right, next slide, please. But what's the result of all these fancy catios? This is what it's really all about. We've got our cat inside the catio, living in harmony with wild birds on the outside. All right, next slide, please. So besides catio, let's talk about ways to prevent birds from hitting windows. One of the most important things to do is to start by identifying which windows in your home or your business or work site are problematic. Well, obviously anywhere that you've heard a bird strike or you've seen a dead bird is gonna be one of the windows you wanna focus on but it often occurs with windows that are large and do not include screens. So we're gonna look at some different options. We're gonna look at uh, maintaining your insect screens, some adding some external physical barriers. We're gonna talk about painting the glass. Um, we're gonna talk about the importance of the location of your bird feeders, building with bird-friendly glass and commercial films, and the use of UV reflective products. I do wanna bring this one resource to your attention. The organization that is kind of like the subject matter expert on bird collision avoidance is the American Bird Conservancy, ABC. They review all the different products and give them a rating. You can look at all kinds of do-it-yourself and homeowner and commercial and architectural solutions to bird window strikes. You just have to Google ABC and glass collisions and you'll get the site with everything you need. Next slide, please. All right, so first and foremost, make sure that you've got your window screens, your insect 
window screens working on your on your windows in your house. A lot of people take them off because they keep the air conditioning on, you know, maybe most of the year. But go ahead and put those screens back on because they're going to help with the birds. On our right is a bird screen designed specifically for window frames that do not have a track that would allow a regular insect screen to be placed there. This one is suspended by a couple of simple suction cups. They can also be sus suspended by mounts that would be drilled into the window frame. They, they run about two or three inches away from the glass and they act a little bit like a trampoline. If a bird does head for the window, say perhaps it's being pursued by um, a predator, like maybe a Cooper's hawk, when it hits the screen, it's a little bit like a trampoline and it kind of bounces off, reducing the potential injury to the bird. Next slide, please. And here's an example of what you can do with paint. Get the kids out, get that non-toxic temper paint, get your brushes out, get your acrylic paint out, have fun at the holidays, You do some seasonal decorations. But one of the things I wanna point out here is that notice above and around our friend Woodstock's picture here on top of Snoopy's head, you can see quite a bit of blue sky. So one of the things that's critical when you are trying to make a window pane more visible to birds is the spacing. And in this case, I would have added some additional paint there so that the spacing between the painted objects and the blue sky are much smaller. And we'll talk about that spacing in just a moment. But you don't even have to use paint and brush. This window at the bottom was done by students at the University of British Columbia, and it's done with paint pens. Yes, those same paint pens that are locked up behind the counter because they're so popular with graffiti artists, but those paint pens can also be used to keep birds from striking windows. Now, some of you may have seen or purchased or even made your own hawk silhouettes to put in the window. Don't even bother, they don't work. Next slide, please. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the spacing between your bird feeder and your home. And this is true also for bird baths. Anywhere from the edge of the house up to three feet from the house, is the initial recommendation. Then if you're gonna put it further away from the house, put it at least 30 feet away from the house. Now there's a couple of reasons for this and they're, they're pretty logical when you think about it. A bird that's only two or three feet away from the house on a feeder that gets startled by a predator cannot get up enough speed to strike the window hard enough to cause a fatal blow. So by having the feeder close to the house, they're less likely to injure themselves. Conversely, by having the feeder farther away from the house, they can't, they, I'm sorry, they can view the whole home and notice that there are exit paths around the house itself without flying into that little window space that looks like sky that's on the side of the house. This is not the best and only thing you can do, but it is definitely a contributing factor. If you are considering building a home or if you're replacing the windows in your home, I hope you will consider purchasing bird-friendly commercial glass. There's a variety of different kinds and they come in all different price ranges, but some of them are quite pricey. So as an alternative to actually using architectural bird-friendly glass would be to uh, have a commercial film added to the glass. And fil films have the added benefit of increasing your privacy, reducing glare, and reducing cooling costs in the summertime. Next slide. And then the one I wanna talk about the most because it's a simple cost effective do-it-yourself solution is the use of ultraviolet light reflective bird tape, dots and stickers. You can see in the image on the right that in the window pane on the left that there's just sort of a semi-transparent image of the hummingbird on the flower. But when light hits that image, the birds see the ultraviolet light reflected back. So the way they got this photograph was simply to take an ultraviolet flashlight or a similar light and shine it on the decal and they just glow bright and dense and really show the bird, hey, this is, this is not what you think it is. This is something solid. On the left, this gentleman is installing ABC tape. Again, the American Bird Conservancy. He's using the narrower tape in this particular example. And this is the actual packaging that it comes from. This is uh, the three inch wide tape that comes from the American Bird Conservancy. We'll see an example of this in use in just a moment. Next slide. This is another product that I'm actually considering purchasing for one of the windows in my home. And it's called Feather Friendly. And it's a tape that has a series of dots on it. And it's very easy to use. You simply measure down from the top of your window pane and run the tape across and then peel off the backing and the dots are there. 
But the question I have for you has to do with the photograph on the left. Is all the glass in your yard attached to your house? Perhaps not. Perhaps you have a backyard with a view, an overlook that has glass panels. Perhaps you have a patio like the one in this photograph. You have to consider the potential for birds striking that glass as well. And this is a wonderful solution for that. Next slide, please. All right. You can get as creative as you want, or you can be as simple as you want. This photograph on the right actually comes from a zoo in Virginia, where obviously some of their staff got very busy cutting up some of the bird reflective tape and creating this beautiful image. The one on the left is a nice example of the three inch ABC tape being used. And studies show that the larger the piece of tape, if you will, the larger the reflective pattern, the less likely the birds are to hit the glass. Okay, next slide, please. All right, another way to reduce window collisions is the Lights Out for Birds program. Now, this is a program that provides safe passage for nocturnal migrants, and National Audubon promotes this um, program across the country, and they've gotten quite a few cities to participate. In my example here, the upper photo is the skyline of Philadelphia with the lights on. The lower photo is after the Lights Out program was initiated during spring and fall migrations. But what can you do in your home to help? Well, how about turning off the interior lights, especially if you have multiple story homes on the higher stories. Close those curtains and blinds during migration season. You can install motion sensors that will turn the lights on when you come into a room and turn them off after a period of inactivity so that you never have to remember to turn the lights off. You can also reduce atrium and skylight lighting when possible. Next slide. This is a long list of all the wonderful cities across the country that are now participants in the Lights Out program. Sadly, Los Angeles is not listed. We hope one of these days soon. Next slide. So by turning off excess lighting, we can help provide migration birds with a safe passage between their nesting grounds and their wintering grounds. Next. Now here's a little bit of good news. Fortunately, the, the scope of this problem has become um, more familiar to many, many cities. And because of the Lights Out program as well, more and more cities are engaged in bird-friendly legislation and ordin ordinances that help protect birds. One of the really big ones more recently was 2019 in New York City. From houses to skyscrapers, they must use a minimum of 90% bird-friendly materials in the creation of new buildings. Similar ordinances were passed in Mountain View, California in 2017 and in Ontario, Canada in 2010. And our photograph here is from Los Angeles, and this is our bird-friendly Los Angeles Convention Center. Next. So I'm gonna end my program with the same photo that I started with, our pretty tabby cat with the purple bell. Remember him? Well, first I wanna do my little summary on the right here. How do we become local stewards for birds? That was kind of the title of this program, was Global um, Issues, Local Stewardship. Well, we can do it by making our homes safer for birds and for wildlife. And the two best ways to do that are to keep cats indoors and to make, whoops. Wow, I just lost everything. Interesting. We can still hear you. Yeah, we can still see you and hear you. There we go, it's coming back. Mm, looks like I might have to log on again. Yeah, there it is. No, we can still hear you, you're on. Did you guys lose me too? I lost everybody. No, we no, we have you. See you back. Can you hear us? I see me. Hey, did I go away? No, we can hear you, it, Tina. Okay, well, as long as long as you can yeah. hear me, I'll keep going. I lost everything. I lost sound, picture. Whoops, there it goes again. Sound of a gun. Well, thank goodness it's on my last slide. As long as you can still hear me, I'll go ahead and say that. I'd like to end this program with a, uh, planting a seed of thought. If you look at that photograph of the cat on the catio, you notice there's a whole bunch of people. If you count the legs and body parts, there's actually six people looking at the cat. That's because it was part of the Portland Audubon cat. I think we lost uh, Tina one more time, but what she's saying, is uh, that we can in Claremont maybe inspire some 
um, people to build patios and have a tour that Sustainable Claremont hosts. Maybe there can be, um, you know, some prizes for creativity or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, um, and along with the Pomona Valley Audubon. So lots of room for creative solutions. I don't have a cat, but I sure want to help build a catio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you still hear me, Nina? Yep, now I can hear you. Oh, no, not. She keeps yeah, cutting out. We're going in and out. That, but, that's uh, okay. Anyway, this is our end. So um, what I'm yeah. hoping is I'm going to stop sharing and uh, we can answer questions. And we also have our island biologist, Jen Boyce here, also who can answer questions as well if I can't answer them. That's great. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry we lost Tina there for a minute, but hopefully she'll be back in just a second. Um, I, I wanted to start off with uh, one of my own questions while we wait for some of the other questions from um, the audience um, come in. Um, so one of the questions that um, popped into my mind as I was, I was listening to the presentation um, was just um, in regards to um, local native birds. Um, whether, Nina, it's a good idea to have um, to feed the birds and to leave food out and to you know have a bird bath. If there's anything we should be aware of, any like watch outs for doing more damage than we you know might know. Um, so any guidance there for for you know people who are trying to do the right thing? Okay, great question. Um, and uh, it is okay to feed the birds um, with some caveats. Of course, feeder placement. Um, if there's a a cat stalking the birds, I would take those feeders down for a while. And also you can encourage some unwanted birds, some introduced birds that are having negative impacts on our native birds, such as starlings and house sparrows. And if you get an influx of them, you could shut your feeding stations down for a while. You also really need to keep your feeders clean. Um, so I suggest having two of everything. So you can have one feeder that you're washing with you know, really well, and then uh, while the other one's out and just easily replace them. Um, the thing is, we and this is, uh, I think, uh, Nancy uh, Tresser Osgood asked a question about seeing a lot of dead birds around, especially finches. There has been an outbreak of salmonella that um, is transmitted from bird to bird from the feces getting mixed in with seeds. And so, um, if, you're, if you see a dead bird by your feeder, you might wanna take everything down for a while. And also feeders that have platforms where the seeds and the poop can get all mixed in um, may not be wise. So um, that's what we're recommending. Fortunately in our area, we've had a few pine siskins and house finches, but um, it didn't get to the huge portions of disease that we've seen in some other areas of the country. Does that answer great. your question? That's great. And the same uh, sort of guidance for um, bird baths or, you know, watering sources for birds? Yeah, so water is great and you'll have so much fun watching them take baths. There's nothing more fun. Um, but uh, you want to keep that water clean. Can you hear me and see me now, Nina? I'm on my phone. Um, yes, I can hear you. So yes, I can see you too. Great. Okay. I don't know what's going on with the computer. I've never seen this happen before. It is, the wheel is still spinning trying to reconnect me to the meeting. So I thought I'll grab my phone and give that a try. Okay, perfect. <laughs> That's so great. I, I Glad you're back with us. I guess um, you can do that for me. Yeah, so we're just doing Q and A right now. Just a couple questions, and I don't see any other one. I think you got to Nancy's question, um, uh, Nina. So I have another question for you with regards to local native birds. Um, and you know, early in your presentation, you had a um, uh, uh, sort of slide showing you know, which birds have been most affected and are facing the steepest declines. Um, I was wondering if that's true for the Claremont area too. If it's the ground birds that are, you know, most affected by cats, or if there are certain species that we see, um, you know, doing okay that are native species, and others that are more affected by the by windows and cats and all those other things you pointed out. 
Great, great question. Okay, so so there are some good news birds, um, but um, Claremont birds are suffering the same declines, except for a few groups. And one of those groups are waterfowl. Ducks and geese are actually doing better because of protections that have been put in place. Um, and so that's good news. Um, the other um, group that's um, um, doing a little better are raptors, birds of prey, um, because of some um, legislation around um, some of the chemicals that were affecting them. But they're still pretty vulnerable. And one of the things I really recommend is do not use rat poison because they go from those the prey up to our owls and hawks who are doing a great job killing our rats and mice and things that you don't want around. So um, we that's one thing that's really important to keep in mind as well. But yeah, so there's, um, you know, it's funny because we've all been looking at birds a lot more now lately, um, being home and setting up our feeders. So it, there's an illusion like, wow, there are more birds than ever. But that is because you're seeing them more and enjoying them more. Um, uh, but overall, like the long-term uh, data show that there are big declines happening. But there are other things you can do too, like habitat loss is a big impact. Um, and so like buying shade grown coffee is bird friendly. Um, try to reduce plastics because um, plastics are a big problem for seabirds that are consuming large amounts of plastic. These are all things Sustainable Claremont can really take the lead on and has already done such a great job with planting native plants. The thing is Claremont is like a beautiful island for migratory birds. They're flying along and they see all these yards with native plants and it's great to sustain these birds, like especially like hummingbirds that are looking for that fix before they go on their migration. Um, and also, you know, it's been great for our native birds, like even just one native plant, they've done studies that show that they can have higher bird diversity in the native plants than in the non-native plants. So that's another great thing to do here in Claremont. That's great. And so for, for someone like me who, you know, might know, you know, some of the, the more well-known birds, some of which I don't know if they're native or not, is there um, like a Sibley guide you would recommend or like um, uh, Audubon guide for birds that could help walk, you know, just the lay person or maybe like yeah. an easy entry point for like getting in to bird identification mm -hmm. type stuff? Okay, so I have a couple recommendations. The Cornell Lab has a, of Ornithology has a great app on your phone. It's called Merlin and it will help you identify birds. So, and it's just so much fun. And the other thing is um, I, do, I am a big fan of the Sibley Guide for Birds West. Um, just the Western birds and the beautiful maps along with the descriptions and the drawings is just fantastic. David Sibley is amazing. Um, and um, the other thing is the Pomona Valley Audubon is a great group to join no matter the level of your knowledge of birds. They have monthly meetings. Um, now they're on Zoom, but they also will have them on in person and they We'll eventually go back to some of the family friendly bird walks at the California Botanic Gardens that they um, So right now they're suspended, but they will continue. But there are other walks that are continuing. So you can go to their website and they have hikes you can do with bird experts who can really help you point out those uh, the birds around us. So I highly recommend yeah. joining them. Actually, Nina, we'll be resuming field trips in September, and we'll be resuming our fourth Sunday of the month walks at Benelli. We won't be doing the ones at the Botanic Garden just yet. We're postponing those for just, just a bit, but we will finally have at least some outdoor bird activities where you can come along. And the best way to learn about nature is to go outdoors with people that are willing to share their knowledge. And I can tell you there's not a bigger group of people that want to share their knowledge than birders. So please come out with, you know, join us on one of our field trips and you'll be amazed at what you'll be taught to see in here. 
And I also want to put a thumbs up to uh, the app Merlin. Um, in addition to Merlin, you can also get the free app from Audubon, which is more of a traditional bird field guide, but it's entirely in your phone. And whereas David Sibley uses illustrations, uh, Audubon and some of the other apps have photographs. And sometimes it's nice to have both a photograph and an illustration when you're trying to identify a bird. Yeah, that's great. All of that is, you know, such so many great resources at our disposal, especially with local birds, which is just amazing. Um, if so, we've, we've talked a bit about like bird identification and, you know, resources and, you know, getting out there and, and, and protecting the birds. Are there other things we could do to sort of advocate for birds? I know, you, um, Nina, in your presentation, you had a couple pieces of, um, I guess, local and state legislation. Um, anything more locally that we could do in terms of like policy wise that's happening now or regionally or models out there that we could emulate? Yes, actually, um, if you, um, you can go to the ABC website again, and they have like model ordinances for, um, to make bird friendly construction. Um, and that's a really good thing to advocate for. But also, there is a very important piece of legislation, and it's the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And this piece of legislation um, almost got repealed, and what that would have um, during the last administration. And what that would have meant was that companies that injure birds don't have to pay any reparations. That so, um, you know, any like open burning or um, you know pesticide use that kills birds or oil spills that happen that kills birds there wouldn't be any consequences so it's a very important thing so when you see that that piece of legislation is under threat again and biden put a stop to um like repealing it um that that's something to really call your representative and congress people about because um it's it was it's really important to have in place to to keep our birds here <laughs> <laughs> and and locally one of the things you can do is simply increase awareness i mean how many of you before tonight knew that something as simple as a catio or some treatment to your windows could literally save thousands and thousands of bird lives so just help spread the word tell people hey i saw this great program about catios have you ever heard of a catio or perhaps show them your children's paintings on the windows that were done with a two to three inch distance so that you know that the birds won't be flying into the windows. It's just about um, increasing awareness because I mean, how many of you have had someone in your home walk into the glass door, right? And once you, I mean, everybody has, right? But once you do, you remember that and you learn. And next time you're in similar architectural clues like door frames and door handles, you might hesitate and check and see if there's glass there. Birds don't experience the world that way. They don't have an opportunity to learn from striking the glass. They simply die. So increasing awareness is the best thing that you can do to advocate for birds. Another thing um, in Claremont that is kind of an issue near and dear to my heart is the timing of tree trimming. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, um, a lot of tree trimming occurs right when birds are nesting. So. Um, you know, we, we need to really be cognizant of when, when birds are breeding and where they're breeding, um, because um, unfortunately that, that's a really widespread problem. And um, even people, you know, they're bringing the birds in that have fallen out of the tree that they've just cut down or trimmed and um, they don't do well. Um, so let's, uh, let's also like really change our practices of, um, you know, city tree trimming. And we have a simple resource for you on our Pomona Valley Audubon website. It's actually um, a production from Los Angeles Audubon, but it's a tree trimming guide for homeowners. And so you can go to our website and just look at that document and that'll help you decide when, where, and how to trim your trees. That's great. And I'm just gonna put that um, uh, URL here in the chat box too. Throwing a couple of URLs in there so everyone has that resources. 
Great. Um, at, at their fingertips. Nicole, um, did I miss any questions or did anything kind of skate past us um, that we need to revisit or, or be good? Um, not that I saw now. I have a question. Hi, Nancy. You have a question? Uh, I have a question. And we have a uh, fountain in the front yard, a recirculating fountain, and the birds love it. They use it for a water bath, they drink out of it. Uh, but it tends to grow algae. And I didn't know if I could, if there was something I could put in it that would inhibit the algae that would not hurt the birds. I'll take that question. I would encourage you to just Google bird safe algicides. Okay. Because, yeah. And our friends at um, the Vermas at, that own Wild Birds Unlimited in Claremont, they might be able to recommend some products oh, as well. Okay, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people just use a little bit of vinegar. Um, the vinegar makes the water a bit more acidic, but it doesn't make it poisonous to the birds. And sometimes just changing the pH that little bit can help reduce the algae in your fountain. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great question, Nancy, thanks for that. Um, any other questions before we sign off here? I'm glad to hear that Nancy has a water feature in her yard because in many cases, water more than food will attract birds to your yard, especially if that water is moving. So that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, but the, the fountain is nice, the birds like it. Unfortunately, there is a cat two doors down <laughs> that um, goes outside and he's discovered the fountain and he likes to come and hide under our bench and wait for birds. I haven't seen him catch any yet, but he's lurks. Mm -hmm. Well, a garden hose might help eliminate that <laughs> problem. <laughs> might discourage him from taking that spot. All right, great. Um, I'll give one last second here to make sure there aren't any other trickling questions coming in. Um, but I think we might be good. So Nina and Tina, that was just like a delightful dialogue. And I'm so grateful that the both of you were able to, to come present to us tonight about all the amazing research. And you know, it's also applicable to us um, here in the Claremont community and, and beyond. And so um, we'll be seeing everyone at the next catio tour that you know we're gonna have to figure out, you know, some sort of plan for, and we could do some joint uh program between uh all of us, and that'd be just excellent. So thank awesome. yeah, thank you both again. We'll we'll distribute this um video in the coming days. Um, and I think that's all we got. So thank you all. All right, well, thank thanks you. Thanks again for having us. Alrighty. Thank you.